Everyone says that to be a great project manager in engineering, you need to understand scope, schedule, and budget. And while that's true, there is one skill set that you will need to develop in order to be able to oversee and manage the scope, schedule, and budget, but most people don't talk about it. Well, in this episode, we're thrilled to have with us Chris Perry. Chris is Senior Vice President and Program Director with Wolpert, and he's got a ton of experience interacting with clients as a project manager, and he's going to give us what that one skill set is today. With that, let's jump right in. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest onto the show for today. Chris Perry is the Senior Vice President and Program Director with Wolpert. And Chris, welcome to the Engineering Project Management Podcast. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. All right, so Chris, just to get us going here, in your own words, tell our, our audience a little bit about yourself. What is it that you do on a daily basis for Wolpert? Sure. So my background is uh, civil engineering. Uh, I've been with the company now for over 30 years uh, and the bulk of my project work, my client work over the years has been land development type projects, mainly for private sector clients that are doing commercial housing, industrial type projects. Um, over the years, uh, my experience has grown from being a project engineer to being a lead engineer, project manager, and now program director. Uh, where where a, a big part of what I'm doing is not only helping our teams with projects, uh, but also helping our clients advance their projects and 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 trying to find bigger programs for us to work on. Hmm. Okay, so kind of like is a program like a kind of a portfolio of projects almost? Yeah, most of our clients are actually what we call them either rollout programs where a client's building more than one of something, or you know more than eighty percent of our work is repeat business. And so a lot of our project types uh, that we're working on, we actually work on the next year, a couple different locations, the next year, more locations. So we really focus on making sure we have repeat clients. Okay, that's awesome. And so following up on that, based on the fact that, you know, repeat clients are so important in our world, which I totally agree with. Also knowing that for most project managers, when you start to get some training, you know, a lot of times the training focuses around the hard PM skills, like managing scope, schedule, budget. But maybe you can talk a little bit about why client relationships, you know, are so important when it comes to project management. You know, all, all of those uh, project management training things are absolute critical to becoming a good project manager. You have to understand the project, you understand the disciplines that are working on the project, understand scope, schedule, budget. That's all the baseline information as a project manager you have to have a good handle on. What I like to look at is really it's that client relationship. And I feel that's really the key to the business, the key to uh, expanding the business, turning clients into repeat clients, having them come back uh, for more opportunities, um, you know, maintaining and expanding those existing relationships based mm -hmm. upon how you approach the project and how you interact with the client are all just as equally important as to the quality of work that the design team is putting together. And the way that I've always looked at it is you can, you can win clients based upon your approach, your responsiveness, but you can also lose clients for the lack of responsiveness, the lack of communication. So we really work with our teams to make sure they understand not only the technical side of what they're doing on their projects, but also that relationship with the client and how important that is. Um, a cu couple specific things related to that would be making sure that we're listening to our clients, making sure we understand their projects, understand the, the needs that they have, um, understand their business drivers, mm. you know, for their project. It's not just an engineering project they're doing. It's a much bigger uh, a project than just the engineering work we're doing. And so understanding um, what their priorities are, what their goals are for a project, and then making sure that we're making our client's life easier. Hmm, that, that's that's what it really comes down to. When we focus on that relationship and understanding our clients, you know, that's how we can really help them. No, I love that, especially those last couple of points, because in our, in the PM training that we do, typically, we have an exercise where we ask 
our participants to talk about what their firm expects of them as project managers, but then we also, you know, what your clients expect from you, which can be a little bit different. And clients often will say things like, you know, make me look good, make my life easier, you know, things of that nature. So you have to really think about it in that perspective. And, and really, I think it's important to highlight what Chris talked about in terms of, again, repeat business, because a lot of project managers don't realize that you are kind of the cash flow engine of your firm in multiple ways. One of them, because your management styles or management abilities can drive the profitability of the projects in terms of scope, schedule, budget. But also, if you're building the good relationship with the clients and they're bringing you more work, that's just another way that you have that financial impact on the firm. So there's a lot to think about there, but it is really important stuff. And, and, and Chris, I want to ask you, you know, Things have changed over the last few years, obviously, with COVID and everything that's going on. We have a lot more people working remotely. With that being said, you know, how can project managers still kind of maintain a high level of service and interaction with their clients, even when we're not all on a project site together anymore like we used to be? I'll say that there's a number of challenges. One of them, we don't sit next to each other any longer. Our teams are within our company or in different places. Um, another challenge for today is being short staffed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk to other engineering architecture firms and they're kind of dealing with the same problems of not having enough people. And then on the client side, um, they have very high expectations with extremely fast paced schedules. So what we try to do with our guys is making sure that we're communicating with those, with the clients, making sure we're talking to them, whether it's good news or bad news is if we're talking to them on a regular basis, a daily basis, we can keep them in tune with what's going on with the project. Uh, and then we make sure that our teams are solution focused, um, next step driven. Um, there's going to be challenges on projects. There's going to be problems and making sure that we're thinking ahead. So when we bring a challenge to a client that we're also thinking ahead of how do we solve the problem? Uh, we used to talk about uh, the main three drivers for our services were schedule, budget, and quality of work. Hmm. And a lot of times when clients are getting very, uh, you know, it, uh, there's one that's more important than the other. We used to say, pick two of those. Pick two. We can focus on two of those things, schedule, budget, and quality. Well, today, quality is a given. You have to have quality of work. Uh, it's now, how do you balance all three of those? Hmm. And what we've found is the, the schedule and the budget is making sure that the team's fully understand the schedule and the budget, make sure the client fully understands our schedules and our scope of work, which in turn is our budget, making sure that everybody's on the same page. It'll help us balance that uh, much better than we used to be able to do. And by not having all the teams sitting next to each other, what we're really relying on is that technical capability of the team leaders, uh, making sure that the, the support people on their projects are being communicated to you know, when we used to sit next to each other, we would talk all day long next to each other. Mm -hmm. Now that we don't sit next, next to each other, guess what we do? We talk to each other all day long. And it may be talking, it may be chatting, it may be texting, but we're using all the technology to make sure we are communicating on all of our projects. And I feel like that's been, you know, this this time that we've been, you know, during COVID as far as is a whole change in our business model, I think our communication in a lot of cases has gotten a lot better because we are open with it you know, 24 seven all day long. It's not just only when you see somebody live and in person. Hmm. Yeah. I like that a lot. And, you know, I think one of the things that I like a lot about that is you do hear a lot of times people talking about, um, you know, budget, scheduling, quality, like again, these PM skill sets. And I do think that the way to manage those all effectively, which we often tell our training participants is having those good people skills, right? Going back to what you said earlier, right? If there's an issue with the cost and you're able to communicate it effectively and ahead of time with the client, you can smooth that out and work it out. If there's an issue with the schedule, if you get out in front of it, if you can communicate well, if you can look at it and figure something out, you get ahead of it. So it really comes down to, yes, those different PM areas are important. And a lot of times it takes those client relationships and the people skills to be able to manage all those effectively. And I think sometimes that's what people are missing through that. So it's good to hear you kind of reiterate, re reiterating the importance of that um, and that communication and, and how to go about doing that. And I guess one kind of kind of follow-up question on that is, how about in terms of communicating with your clients, 
communicating both for the short term and the long term so that you continue to drive value. I think, you know, like you said earlier, which I think is something we have to keep thinking about is this is hopefully not a one and done client. So how do you communicate with, to show them that you're not just thinking about tomorrow or today, you're thinking about the future? Yeah, I think that's the, uh, when, when we're trying to balance our schedules, our budgets, our quality of our work, uh, as a project manager, and you instill that with the project team is how do we provide value to this client? Um, what, where can we provide value f- utilizing our experience in this business? You know, how do we, how do we find, you know, some of the, the new tools, um, technologies that we use on different projects? How can we bring that to this specific project with this specific client? And so using that experience and using the tools, I think is a great way to show to a client or help help them understand the value of the services that we're providing. We're not just providing only X for Y dollars at Z quality. It's There's a lot more to it than that. And there's quite a few areas that we look at as far as trying to provide value to our clients. Yeah, I love that. So it's really like showing them a kind of a well-rounded approach and all the different areas are able to provide value, not necessarily maybe in just specifically the project management, but, you know, we have other resources that we can bring to the table. We have technology we can help you with to, to forecast your projects and things of that nature, showing them that, you know, you can really help them and they're getting a lot out of their relationship with you. And it's not one dimensional, so to speak. Right. And this is, a, this is an area that I really enjoy mm-hmm. uh, in my career. And I, I've kind of t- made up this term on my own. I call it smarter earlier. Mm-hmm. A lot of our clients, when they are starting mm-hmm. a project, they're let's say they're looking at a piece of property that they want to build some type of a building on. And there's a lot of, uh, they call it a due diligence phase where we're looking into a lot of different engineering things. The legal is looking into legal things, entitlements. Um, you start looking at environmental issues and such, but what helps our clients, the value we bring to our clients is let's help them be smarter earlier. Smarter earlier, meaning one of the, one of the tools we use is we call it a, um, a site investigation study, an SIR, and we research the property. We research the property to determine what they're allowed to build on the property from a zoning perspective, uh, what the property uh, can take as far as utility services coming to the property, stormwater management, uh, geotechnical services, environmental services. There, there's a lot to investigate on a property. And what we're trying to do is to try to find those challenges to the property. Challenges meaning what you're allowed to develop, how much it's going to cost to develop, how long it's going to take to develop. If we can identify those things earlier in a project, then our clients can then make decisions, better decisions as far as proceeding with a project, or maybe they don't proceed forward with the project based upon one of those criteria. So that's one area we really look at is is doing those early site investigation studies uh, to help our clients understand the properties. Uh, Another area that we look at is um, most of our projects, the the projects are typically um, high confidentiality. So we talk with our clients about what what we're allowed to talk to the local communities about, because Mm -hmm. getting the local communities engaged in the project early is a great way to find out if it's going to be a straightforward process, an easy process, or a very difficult, challenging process. And so we like to try to engage the city officials as early as we can, um, bring those stakeholders to the table, and that way they can help us map out the process to get approvals for the project. And then one last area that we've we, on a technology side that we use, it's a it's a, a relatively newer tool um, that's called Site Ops, and it helps us evaluate uh, the site development costs on a project. Hmm. Uh, and this tool, um, what it does is it allows us to evaluate um, not only the design, but with the parameter of cost, unit cost from contractors, all of it at the same time. And what that does is it lets us take a look at a piece of property and let, let, let's say what used to take us weeks to evaluate a project now takes us days. Wow. What used to take days now takes us hours to come up with the site development cost for a project. And so again, being able to do that earlier in a, in a project, earlier in the process, it helps our clients be smarter earlier. That's that's awesome. I mean, that just gives them 
gets them so ahead of the curve and what they're trying to accomplish, you know, and again, put so much more value on what you're able to offer them. And I would imagine, Chris, when you're talking about that last part there and doing some of that site with the site ops, you could probably look at earthwork and all kinds of stuff like that, right? That's exactly what it does. Yeah. And that's, that really is when you're looking at, you know, developing on a piece of property, a lot of cases, they have a good idea of what the building is going to be and how right. much the building is going to cost. The right. biggest variable is the property, is the site work. Right. And that's why a tool like this helps us identify those issues much earlier in the process. Yeah, I think that from my experience myself working as an engineer in land development, that due diligence is such a great avenue to be a differentiator if you do that well. Because again, a client's coming to you with a, a parcel of property. If you're the more information you can give them, like, hey, there's some wetlands here, there's some historical issues here, you know, that may save them thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on making smarter decisions, passing on a property, buying a property, having to buy a property next to it for whatever reason. Um, so I love that because if you're, if you have to put yourself, I think, in the customer's shoes, right? And if you're looking at making an investment, the more information, it's like when you go to buy a house, the more information you can get around that property or about that property, it, it's a differentiator. And to me, the other value for that, part of that is the next time they have a property, if you did a really good due diligence study, they're obviously coming back to you. And, and when they come back to you at that stage of the project, the project is most likely yours, assuming they go forward with it. Exactly. Well, what's also interesting is we have one, you know, lots of groups we work with that have what we call rollout programs where they're building the same basic building across the country. And one of the jokes that we have is our job is to kill the project. Right. Kill it early. <laughs> Kill it early before they spend a lot of money. But if there's challenges with it, let's find out those big issue challenges early so that we don't, so that neither side ends up spending a lot of money pursuing a property that's just not going to work. Right. Poke holes in it where you can. And I think yeah. that that also builds a lot of trust with people because if I tell you that this property is not going to work for you, I'm essentially, we're losing money because we're not going to get to do engineering work on it. So it shows them that like you're a hundred percent honest because they could have strung us along, did some engineering design, done some stuff on it, but they're coming right out front and they're letting us know, which means most likely they're going to go find another site and they're going to call you again. Right. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So lots of good stuff there to think about and digest. You know, the client relationship is such an important aspect of project management. So for those of you that are project managers out there, I know you want to get your PM training. You want to understand scope, scheduling, budgeting, all critically important, but you also got to have a good foundation in people skills, you know, people interaction, client interaction, because that's going to help you kind of hold all of that stuff together. Um, you know, and you'll often find that there's really good technical people you can pull onto your team, but not everybody can really manage the clients effectively. And that's why we wanted to bounce some of this stuff off of Chris. All right. So what we're going to do a quick, a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to get one last PM pitfall from Chris and we'll wrap this one up. All right. We're back with Chris Perry, Senior Vice President and Program Director at Wolpert. Chris talked a lot about client interaction today. And now it's time for our PM pitfall segment. And today, Chris, what we want to know from you is what's one of the bigger PM pitfalls or challenges that you've seen in your time as a project manager? And how would you recommend a PM can either overcome it or, or try to avoid this challenge? Sure. I think one of the, 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 the most difficult things as as an engineer, as a project manager, is communicating, let's say, bad news to your client. Mm. Uh, you know, it's easy to talk about all the good things that are going on, but when some things aren't going the right way, some challenges are happening, and there's really some bad news on the project, um, that could be really difficult to pick up the phone and communicate to the client and explain to them. Um, what, what I have found is that, and I've done it both ways, meaning I've let it linger and how much pain that was when I let it linger versus attacking it head on. And it's a very difficult conversation, but yet at the end of the conversation, especially with the relationship, there's an appreciation for the communication. Hmm. So my recommendation is even when there's bad news is you try to address it as quickly as possible, directly, honestly uh, with the client. And that'll be your best path forward as far as the relationship goes. It's a great, it's great advice. And in fact, our, our lead instructor for our PM training, Anton Malavage always says, the bad news is not like wine. Like it doesn't get better with time. It's more of like a piece of fish, right? Like it starts smelling worse and worse the longer you let it sit. Exactly. And so 
Um, yeah, I think, you know, Chris is right on there. I mean, if you, you're going to, and, and let's be honest, you're going to have bad news on your projects. I mean, this is, it just happens. I mean, that's what project management is like navigating all the different challenges, whether it's supply chain these days, budgeting, scheduling, something happened with the schedule. So when that happens, you've got to go to your client. You've got to flush it out with them, explain it to them. And, and like Chris said earlier, bring a solution to the table, right? Think through a couple of solutions, bring them to the table right away. And I think what happens in that scenario is if you do that over time, initially, of course, no one wants to hear bad news. But once the client sees that you're bringing it to them to try to help them resolve it quickly and get their projects back on track, I've always found, Chris, that, that, that then you become one of their favorite design consultants or consultants to work with because they know you're just going to be honest and keep the projects on track. Absolutely. I mean, that, that trust that you're building uh, throughout the project that hopefully is going to continue on as a repeat client. Uh, that trust that you're building is is the key to the whole relationship. Yeah, totally agree. All right, well, once again, Chris Perry from Wolper. Chris, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the Engineering Project Management Podcast. We really appreciate it. No, it's been great. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Chris today. It really is a problem that a lot of project managers are looking to get really good at managing the scope, schedule, and budget, but you can't do it without those really good people skills, including your communication skills. So I hope that you'll remember that and certainly strive to develop those skill sets. If you like the video, please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineering professionals become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.